Good afternoon. Welcome, everyone. Um, may I introduce myself? I'm Dr. Angela Yimun Wang from Hong Kong, former executive committee member of KDGO. First of all, I would like to thank KDGO for organizing this lunchtime webinar on general nephrology and dialysis in the times of COVID-19. And thanks to KDGO for inviting me to moderate this webinar. I would also like to thank Novata Singapore for supporting this KDGO webinar. Today, we are honored to have Dr. Park Hui Chung from South Korea and Dr. Hua Su, China, to share their local country experiences in managing COVID-19 in relation to the kidney aspects. The objective The objective of this one-hour webinar is to understand the acute kidney injury associated with COVID-19 infection, to understand renal histopathological abnormalities from autopsy for patients with severe COVID-19 infections, and also clinical practice guidelines adopted in South Korea to control COVID-19 infection in hemodialysis centers. So just to remind everyone before the lecture starts, there will be a Q&A session after both of the talks. And you're all very welcome to submit your questions in writing through the webinar platform so for further discussion. So without further much ado, may I invite our first speaker, Professor Park Ho Chung from South Korea, to give the first talk titled, Dialysis During COVID-19, Guidelines and Practice in Korea. So just a brief introduction, Professor Park is currently Professor of Medicine at Gangnam Severance Hospital, Yonsei University College of Medicine in South Korea. He's also the current director of the External Affairs and Cooperation at the Korean South Society of Nephrology. Thank you, Professor Park. Uh, thank you for the kind introduction. Uh, I'm Hyung Chun Park from Gangnam Severance Hospital, Yonsei University, Seoul, Korea. Uh, I would first like to thank the KDGO for the, giving me the opportunity to introduce the Korea's uh, clinical practice guideline for hemodialysis during the COVID-19 outbreak. These are my disclosures. Uh, uh, this afternoon, I will mainly talk on the Korean Society of Nephrology's uh, clinical practice guideline. And in the last five to six minutes, I will briefly summarize the paper that has recently been accepted by Jason that describes the successful prevention of secondary uh, transmission of COVID-19 in hemodialysis units by implementing our uh, new uh, clinical practice guideline. ESRD patients treated by hemodialysis are quite unique from general population as they uh, need to receive regular hemodialysis treatment thrice weekly in a very narrow space and they are of old age and have multiple underlying comorbidities such as diabetes, hypertension, and cardiovascular disease, and have impaired immune response, rendering them vulnerable to infections. Therefore, more attention are needed to block rapid transmission of infection and high mortality rates among the uh, hemodialysis patients. Back in 2015, Korea suffered from Middle East Respiratory Syndrome coronavirus outbreak. In total, 186 cases with 38 fatalities were reported, and a total of 83% of transmissions were due to five super spreaders. Of note, 40% of MERS cases were patients who had been exposed in nosocomial environment, especially in emergency departments. Nearly 17,000 individuals were quarantined uh, for for two weeks to control the outbreak with huge socioeconomic out, uh, impact. And this outbreak provided a unique opportunity for Korean government as well as uh, medical societies to detect weak points of infrastructure our, of our medical system, especially of preparedness for emerging global infectious diseases. The medical crisis prompted the government to reform the healthcare system and medical societies, including KSN, to develop clinical practice guidelines for preventing infectious diseases in hemodialysis facilities with emphasis on early detection and isolation. Uh, strict patient surveillance along with proper isolation practice 
that include single room isolation and cold isolation and self quarantine effectively prevented secondary transmission of virus to others in 2015. Uh, in total, 116 hemodialysis patients from three hemodialysis units were uh, exposed to the uh, MERS coronavirus infection. And the uh, strict patient surveillance and proper isolation practice prevented uh, any further sec secondary transmission of the virus. Uh, the authors therefore emphasize that a renal digester protocol, which includes proper contact surveillance and isolation practice must be established in the future to accommodate the needs of hemodialysis patients during digesters or outbreaks. Uh, this is the timeline of COVID-19 infection in Korea. The first imported case of COVID-19 was detected on January 20th during a screening at Incheon International Airport. The carrier was a Chinese woman from Wuhan, China. And after the initial case, uh, Korea saw a steep spike of case numbers in the following weeks and reached its peak daily count of, uh, on February 29th with 909 new cases and up nearly 500 from the previous day. Korea then became the second most infected country after China by early March. First case of hemodialysis patient was reported on February 19th, about one month from the initial case report. Korea undertook a massive public and private sector effort, effort to fashion a national response to the pandemic. Calling on the previous experience with MERS during 2015 outbreak, the Joint Committee of KSN and KSDT quickly formed a COVID-19 task force team in mid-January this year. On January 31st, initial draft of the Manual for Clinical Practice Guideline to prevent secondary transmission of COVID-19 within hemodialysis facilities were posted on KSN website in Korean even before any infected hemodialysis patient was reported. Since late February, KSN started sending out newsletters to its members regarding COVID-19 and the clinical practice guideline. And the practice guideline has been revised according to changes in case definitions and response guidelines of Korean CDC. Latest revision was made just last week, and online English version of this clinical practice guideline was released yesterday. And this can be accessed and downloaded from the uh, Korean Research Clinical Practice uh, website, the official journal of KSN, to use freely by its members. The general principles of guideline are comprised of education and screening of patients, as well as healthcare individuals. Education emphasizes the uh, patient and all health carriers health care workers uh, to carry out personal hygiene, uh, wear surgical masks, and hand, use hand sanitizers at entrance of the unit, keep proper distance to minimize patient-to-patient -patient contact, closing down waiting rooms or resting areas, and restricting caregivers or visitors in the hemodialysis unit uh, to, to prevent any uh, further uh, transmission. And prohibit inter-hospital transfer during the outbreak and to contact local public health center or Korean CDC in any case of a, a, a patient outbreak. Screening includes uh, instructing patients to call ahead and check history of prior history or visit to outbreak regions and any patient contact history and uh, newly developed respiratory symptoms. And screening also includes checking body temperature before coming to the dialysis facility. And if the body temperature is over 37.5 degrees Celsius or develop newer respiratory symptoms such as dry cough, sore throat, or uh, shortness of breath, the patient should not visit the hemodialysis unit without notifying the healthcare worker and suspected or confirmed COVID-19 infection should not enter the hemodialysis unit. 
And for those uh, uh, suspected patients, rapid lab tests for coronavirus uh, using PCR is highly recommended. The case definitions are taken from the COVID-19 response guideline of the Korean CDC, and they classify subjects into four groups and help to conduct appropriate response measures. Confirmed cases are a person who has been tested positive for COVID-19 pathogen in accordance with uh, testing standards such as uh, PCR irrespective of clinical symptoms or signs. Suspected case is a person who develops a fever over 37.5 degrees Celsius or respiratory symptoms such as cough or dry, <clears throat> difficulty breathing within 14 days of coming into contact with a confirmed case while that patient was symptomatic. Patient under investigation uh, is any of the following person who is suspected of having coronavirus disease by their physician, such as pneumonia of unknown case, or second, a patient who develops fever or respiratory symptoms and has a history within 14 days of traveling to a country of local transmission. And third, a uh, patient under investigation, PUI, is a per person with an epidemiological link to collective outbreak of COVID-19 in Korea who has symptoms within the 14 days. Contacts are defined as uh, de determined by epidemiologic investigation and include the following. A patient who has received hemodialysis treatment at the same time as the confirmed case. And second, a patient who received hemodialysis treatment without proper disinfection after hemodialysis of a confirmed case. Third, uh, a, a patient or healthcare worker who was exposed to a confirmed case within two meters are defined as contact. The response measures for suspected case, uh, uh, the patient should wear a surgical mask and should be isolated. And they should be transferred to a designated hospital with a facility for isolation hemodialysis, preferably a negative pressure isolation room. And for designated facilities, they should perform isolation dialysis therapy until the patient is released from quarantine. And established a transfer plan and route with regional public health care center to evacuate from a hemodialysis unit and disinfect hemodialysis room and other spaces immediately after transfer. Infection control measures for uh, maintenance hemodialysis for COVID-19 positive patient or suspected case uh, specify that a patient should be isolated in a single room with negative pressure and should wear a mask and maintenance hemodialysis therapy separate from uninfected patients. The confirmed or suspected case can be released from quarantine if symptoms improve and tests for COVID-19 are negative twice within a 24-hour interval. But if the respiratory symptoms later becomes aggravated, a confirmatory test can be repeated until symptoms improve. And for the healthcare workers that care for the COVID-19 positive or suspected case, they should wear personal protection equipment that comprise of a K4094 or N95 mask, gloves and goggles or facial shield, and level D gown hand hygiene and disinfection of dialysis machines and room after each session and disposal of medical waste uh, as per relevant guidelines should be implemented. And uh, response measures for uh, patient investigation. Uh, they, the healthcare worker or the patient should contact the local public health center or visit a screening center to receive a screening test for COVID-19. And the patient should not enter the hemodialysis unit. And uh, hemodialysis therapy should not be done until the screening tests are negative. And, if, if, and the hemodialysis should be implemented apart from other patients after 
the negative screening test. The quarantine release is recommended when symptoms are free and COVID-19 tests are negative two times with 24-hour interval. If symptoms persist, uh, they should be maintained on separate hemodialysis, even with a ne twice negative test. And for those patients who are classified as contacts, they should undergo immediate screening tests for COVID-19. And they should only uh, undergo uh, hemodialysis after the negative screening test. Hemodialysis with cord isolation for 14 days from the date of contact is recommended. And the patient should be released from quarantine uh, if they develop no symptoms and COVID-19 tests are negative on day 13 of contact. If the contacts develop symptoms, uh, they are now classified as suspected case. For healthcare uh, workers, they should wear uh, personal protection equipment and standard uh, contact and droplet protection should be uh, implemented. The following diagram uh, shows the uh, uh, screening and management of COVID-19 in hemodialysis unit. For example, if the uh, patient is suspected or confirmed the case, they should be transferred to the uh, designated hospital and undergo hemodialysis as per clinical practice guideline. In the next uh, three or four minutes, I will briefly summarize a paper that has recently been accepted for publication in JSON. Uh, the Daegu area, which is in the southern part of the South Korean peninsula, uh, showed the highest incidence of COVID-19 infection in early March with nearly 6,000 positive cases, comprising nearly two-thirds of all cases reported in Korea. And Daegu became the center of outbreak in, uh, in our nation. The paper describes by implementing strict surveillance and cold isolation hemodialysis, uh, they were able to effectively prevent secondary transmission. The figure illustrates the algorithm used in the study. For COVID-19 uh, hemodialysis patients, they are investigated for close contact and starting with immediate screening tests for coronavirus. If results are positive, they are transferred to a designated hospital. If the results are negative, hemodialysis with cord isolation, quarantine for healthcare workers, and the respiratory symptoms as well as measurement of body temperature is done before each hemodialysis. Should the uh, uh, symptoms reappear or screen test is positive, they are transferred to the designated hospital. And if the contacts present no symptoms, they are maintained in isolation and quarantine. Termination of quarantine is when, uh, after contact 13 days, the uh, screening test is negative, the case is released from quarantine. The figure illustrates the number of positive cases and close contacts in 11 hemodialysis facilities in Daegu area. A total of 11 hemodialysis patients and seven healthcare workers were diagnosed as positive for COVID-19. The dark green is the, for the hemodialysis patients and the light green is the healthcare worker. After the initial confirmed uh, case in February 19, the number of close contacts increased steeply uh, on February 25th up to 302. And it was maintained a plateau until March 5th. Uh, no additional confirmed cases were reported at, after March 5th. The table shows the characteristics of confirmed patients and the healthcare workers. Uh, hemodialysis patients were uh, of older age, but both hemodialysis patients and healthcare workers sh showed very similar symptoms. And the right panel uh, illustrates the time course of the diagnosis and the symptoms during the hemodialysis with uh, court isolation. Uh, and for the uh, 18 confirmed cases, up to about 306 close contacts were identified. Uh, with such a high contagious infection like COVID-19, uh, we cannot stress enough of surveillance and early detection and diagnosis and cord isolation. 
Fortunately, as this arrow shows, the only two healthcare workers were diagnosed as having COVID-19 after termination test. That show a low secondary transmission rate of uh, 0.66 inside hemodialysis units that implemented with uh, cord isolation hemodialysis. The flow chart, uh, uh, this figure shows the flow chart of the process of diagnosing COVID-19 uh, and hemodialysis cord isolation and secondary inhibition of this uh, secondary tr transmission in this uh, paper. As shown in the figure, the around 1,200 hemodialysis patients and 278 healthcare workers in 11 hemodialysis units were uh, screened. And initially they confirmed eight patients uh, and four healthcare workers as COVID-19 positive. And after the surveillance and uh, screening, uh, three more hemodialysis patients and one more healthcare worker was uh, confirmed to have COVID-19 infection, and they were transferred to designated hospital or uh, quarantined as per protocol. During the uh, up to 15 days of isolation cord dialysis, they found that uh, two more healthcare workers were positive for COVID-19, but other uh, no more transmission of COVID-19 was detected. In summary, uh, this multi-court center uh, enrolled close contacts, including hemodialysis patients and healthcare workers in 11 hemodialysis units in Daegu, Korea. A total of 302 close contacts were identified through epidemiologic investigation and immediate screening tests. Hemodialysis with cord isolation resulted in a low transmission rate inside hemodialysis uh, facilities. The transmission of COVID-19 can be controlled by early detection with rapid testing and collaboration between institutions and continuous monitoring of infection without closure of hemodialysis centers. Uh, lastly, I would like to thank all the medical professionals, healthcare personnel, volunteers, and all those at the front line of the COVID-19 pandemic who worked tirelessly to provide essential services to the public this time. And I hope that COVID-19 pandemic will end soon, that you may join us at KDGO KSN 2020 Student Symposium that will take place in coming September 26th in Seoul, Korea. Thank you again for your attention. Thank you, Professor Park, for giving us uh, important insights as to how South Korea effectively uh, prevents secondary transmission in the hemodialysis center. So without further much ado, may I invite our second speaker, Professor Su Hua, to give the second talk titled COVID-19 and Kidney Disease Experience from China. Professor Su Hua is currently the Chief Physician at the Department of Nephrology, Union Hospital, Tongchi Medical College, Hua Zhong University of Science and Technology. Thank you, Professor Su. Yes, thanks for the invitation of the Kibigo. Thanks for the sharing of your career experience by, by Dr. Park. And thanks for the hosting and the moderating of Dr. Wang. So today my presentation is titled COVID-19 and the Kidney Disease Experience from China. My name is Hua Su. I'm a nephrologist come from the Yunnan Division of Yunnan Hospital, Tongji Medical College, Huazhong University of Science and Technology. I have no disclosure for this presentation. Today I will share the experience from China from three aspects. First is what I experienced during COVID-19. So I was born and lived in Wuhan City, but sadly my hometown was sick with the COVID-19 from the end of last year. During this epidemic, my role was changed from a nephrologist to a daughter fighting against COVID-19. 
At the beginning, I was very upset and felt helpless since I really don't know how to effectively treat my COVID-19 patient. But soon, I can out from this if it's panic because I am medical personnel and I need to know why this occurs and how to control it. Although to now, I know little of this pandemic, but I will share some experience of um, my center. So first, uh, my role was changed from nephrologist to a general practitioner or respiratory infection doctor. As we know, none is the main target of the COVID-19, and the pulmonary renal syndrome is not unfamiliar to our nephrologist. Such a good partial syndrome caused by the anti basement membrane antibodies, antivasculitis caused by the anti-neutrophy plasmic antibodies and other systematic disease as purpura, SLE, and so on. Next from the other, we knew the viral, viral infections is also be well described in kidney, um, such as Hantan virus. It caused the epidemic hemorrhagical fever. Histologically, it presents as hemological interstitial inflammation in kidney as well as in lung. Also, the HIV, CMV, EB virus, pyrovirus B19 can cause the collapsing FSGS. For the hepatitis B and the hepatitis C virus, it can cause the memory proliferative glomerular nephritis, membranous nephropathy, IgA nephropathy, or the cryogromyonitis. In transplant patient, BK nephropathy is not uncommon. It can cause the tubular interstitial nephritis and the decrease of the renal function gradually. Then detail to the coronavirus infection in kidney, as we know, in this century, there are already two outbreaks of coronavirus infection. First is SARS in 2003, the other in SMERS in 2015. The incidence of ATI in SARS was relatively low compared to MERS. It is around 10%. And the SARS virus attacking tubular epithelia cell while ACE2 receptor. For MERS, the incidence of AKI was high around 30%. It attacking tubular epithelia cell well DPP4. So how about the clinical feature of the renal disorder of COVID-19 in Wuhan. This is a paper published on Kidney International by the colleague of um, my, the other hospital in Wuhan. This is a prospective cohort study of 701 patients with COVID-19 and uh, the author divided the patient into two groups, normal baseline serum creatine group and evacuated baseline serum creatine group. As we can see from the table, the incidence of acute kidney injury is much higher in the elevated baseline group. The percentage is around 11. 0.9 compared to the normal 
phase nine serum creatinine group, the incidence of acute kidney injury is 4.0, and the p-value is 0 0.001. The other is for the in-hospital death rate. The elevated base 9 serum creative group, the rate in hospital death is around 33.7%. And in the normal base 9 group, the rate is 13.2. The p-value is less than 0.001. So the higher base 9 creatinine is associated with increased risk of ATI and also with the increased in hospital death rate. Also, we can see from these two groups, in the elevated base 9 serum creatinine group, the negative rate of protein ureal and hemoturial is much lower than the normal base 9 serum creatinine group. The p value is less than 0 0.001. So it is shown higher base 9 creatinine is associated more incidence or more risk of the protein ureal and uh, hematurial. This is the campaign mail analysis. It is shown in the elevated base 9 BUN and the elevated base 9 serum creatinine group. The incidence of in hospital death, death rate is much higher than the base 9 than in the normal group. The p-value is less than 0 0.001. This figure is shown not only for the base 9, but also for the peak serum creatinine or the acute kidney injury. They are also associated with the higher in hospital death rate. This is in another study. This is a retrospective single center study of Chinese patients with COVID-19. They included 333 patients, and the results show there are 75.4% patients present with renal abnormalities, including protein ureal, it is around 65.8% patient present with protein ureal, and 41.7 patients with hematurial, and 10.5 patients with AKI. And the total renal involvement is 75.4%, uh, and death rate is 8.7%. More interestingly, when we subdivided these patients, According to the severity of the COVID-19 to moderate severe critical year, we found in the critical year group, the percentage or the incidence of the renal abnormality is much higher than the moderate group. Also, when we divide the patient in the AKI non-recover or AKI recover group, what we found is in the critical year patient of the COVID-19, when the PIP patient graded for the COVID-19 severity, we found there are higher non-recover rate of AKI in the critical year group. And in the AKI recover group, the percentage of the people belong to the critical year is much lower. Also for AKI, only see the AKI non-recover group, the stage three AKI rate 
is around 57.9%, but it is much less than the, in the API recover group. So, So from the clinical review, I think we need to monitor the parameter of renal function, especially with pay attention to the ATI in the COVID-19 patient. Next, I will talk about the morphological study of COVID-19 in postum kidneys. With the support and the guidance of the government, we began to perform technological examination in COVID-19 patients from middle February. The technological data was from both middle or a puncture of gross and a puncture autopsy. This is the paper we published on KI titled Renal Physiopathological Analysis of COVID-19 in China, Findings in 26 Post-Mortem Cases by Night Microscopy, Electromicroscopy, and the Immunostaining with draw conclusion, direct parenchyma extraction of tubular epithelia and the podocyte with marked acute tubular injury and the eosinophilic aggregation occurs in severe lethal COVID-19. This is the light microscopy with the HE staining. As we indicated by the arrow, it is show proximal tubular the north of branch border. And also we can see there are debris comprised of the lacrosotica epithelia in the tubular lumen, as we marked as asterisk. In this image, the arrow shows the asymmetrical fine vaccination of tubules. This is usually related with the IVIG therapy or the injection of the hypotonic solution. Also, as we indicated by the arrow hand, we can see there are a lot of ear flow set aggregates obstructing peritubinal capillary. In this image, we can see there are pigment cast in the looming of tubules, as well as the casing deposition in the epithelia of tubules. In this picture, we show the ischemical glomerular contraction and the accumulation of leaked plasma in formal space. This electron microscopy image. We found that there are some coronavirus-like particles in the cytoplasma of the proximal tubular epithelia, with the diameter is around 65 to 67 nanometer. This is a electron microscopy image of the glomeruli. As we can see by the star, we showed uh, there is the GBM, and the arrow show the fruit process, and the arrow hand we show the virus-like particle with the diameter of 106 nanometer. Also, there are double membrane with 16 spikes. This is with the feature of what I see by the electron microscopy. 
This picture is show there are compressed yield through sites in the peritubular capillary looming, and with the expansion of subendothelial area, as we indicated by the arrow hand, this indicates there are some injury of the endothelia. This is the immunostaining from the sequential section with the CD235, CD91, and the CD31. From this, we identified the stuff in the peritubular capillary lumen is the yield flow site without platelet. This is the immunofluorescent staining from the paraben block with the SARS-CoV nuclear protein antibodies. As we can see, we found there are scattered distribution of the positive staining. And from the morphological findings of COVID-19, we showed acute tubular injury was very prominent. Coronavirus-like particles were observed in tubular epithelia as well as in polar site. Near through site accumulated and even occluded microcirculation of kidneys. There is no diagnostic inflammation or present were funded. So we think kidney injury comes from direct and indirect violence of the SARS-CoV-2. And there are also many questions we need to answer. The first one is how about the SARS-CoV-2 Animal tropic in the kidney. So for the tubular epithelia and the foot um, podocyte, it is more sensitive to this virus. I'm not sure. And also for the viral entrance, ACE2 is the only pathway or the receptor for SARS-CoV-2 entry. If there are another molecule or receptor can mediate the viral to invasive. The third question is how about replication mechanism of SARS-CoV-2 in kidney? As we know, after entering into the cell, the viral need to replicate. The last one is can viral and the host living in a state of mechanism and the kidney become a reservoir of virus when the immunal stage is suppressed, can this reoccur? So in the future, I think Long-term follow-up of urine routine examination and the renal function in recovered COVID-19 patient is very important. And to collect the data from the incidence of COVID-19 in transplant patient or patient under immunoprocessive therapy is very important. Last. I think confidence and optimism are very important. So we need to work together to defeat this pandemic. Thanks for you. And uh, this is time for questions. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Su, for the very interesting talk on acute kidney injury. Um, so I think we have about 15 minutes now for um, questions for both uh, Professor Park and Professor Su. And for the audience, you can type your questions um, through the web platform. Um, so perhaps maybe I, uh, let me check the uh, platform to see. Yes, 
maybe I start by asking Professor Park and uh, Professor Sue some questions. So, um, uh, for Professor Park, I noted that on your one of your slides, you have um, indicated for both the patients and the health professionals, um, up to about 28% of the subjects were actually um, asymptomatic. Um, so, how did you identify? Uh, who actually should go through the surveillance or the screening process, because this is actually uh, one of the key issues in terms of the infection control of COVID-19. And in Hong Kong, we also see that uh, there could be asymptomatic uh, uh, carrier who can actually spread the disease silently. So could you actually um, advise us about this aspect? Uh, that's a very important question. Uh, and the one of the... Uh the merit of the uh, and the key point of the Korean Society of Nephrology's uh, clinical practice guideline is that you have a very rapid and immediate screening test. We do a PCR for all the uh, context of the uh, case defined uh, patient. So, as you can see, that of 11 uh, hemodialysis centers, there were about three more than 300 close contacts that were screened for the coronavirus using PCR. And most of the patients and the contacts had the test within one day of uh, surveillance. So if you have a patient, if you, did, if you find a patient and is reported to the healthcare authorities or the uh, dialysis unit, they would contact the K, uh, Korean CDC and the patient or the contact will have uh, the PCR lab test immediately on that day. And the tests usually come out within about six hours. So what I wasn't able to uh, describe in full detail about the uh, comparison of the table uh, in, of the patients and the healthcare workers, but in the study that will be published in JSON, all of the patients were screened and tested on the same day as they were kind of uh, presented at the uh, hospital. So it, it's imperative that you have a system that has a very rapid diagnostic capabilities. Thank you very much, um, Professor Park. Um, I also have one question. Uh, actually, I have several questions for Professor Sue. Um, one other thing is uh, mm -hmm. you indicated that uh, uh, a certain percentage of the subjects actually have two or three plus proteinuria. And you also showed us some acute histopathological changes in the uh, kidneys uh, autopsies. So my, my question is, um, did uh, the histology that you show are mostly tubular injury of the kidneys. Uh, so my question is actually, did you identify any glomerular injury in your China cohort? Because I gather there are some literature reports on collapsing glomerulopathy. Uh, in a KI paper, so I wonder, any um, uh, glomerular lesions identified from your China cohort? Yeah, 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 this is a very good question. So at the beginning, uh, as we found in the, our cohort, the glomerular injury is mainly secondary to the ischemic change. There is no collapsing um, happened in our cohort. Later, there are several reports about the collapsing FSGS um, in the American, especially in the Apple L1 um, mutation, high risk gene popular, pop, pop cohort. So, um, in our time, our cohort, we cannot identified the diagnostic collapsing FSGS or other um, glomerulitis such as the post-infection or the infection related. There is no inflammation in the glomerulite. Also for the tubular interstitial compartment, the inflammation is not uh, um, very obvious. There are just uh, Acute tubular injury is the most prominent problem. And also, we think the acute tubular injury mainly comes from 
mm, the secondary, the the etiology, and also maybe the viral mm, invasion plays some certain role in the acute children injury because we really did see there are virus night particles in the children epithelial cell, also in the podocyte. So I think the, for the collapsing FSGS, maybe it is a very important topic we need to uh, survey on the future. Maybe for our patient in the future, I'm not sure whether the protein urea or the other disorder can be happened. So I think the follow-up is very important in our cohort. Thank you very much. Um, we actually uh, have some questions coming through the web platform, so maybe um, uh, we'll invite both speakers to address some of these uh, questions. So Marjorie uh, from uh, Singapore has actually asked the question, when can the COVID-19 affected hemodialysis patients allowed to go back to their own hemodialysis center. Um, so maybe uh, both speakers can uh, give us some insights in the country. Uh, is the question about when can they be released from the quarantine? Uh, yes, and go back to their own center, yeah. Uh, I think it's stated in the uh, uh, our the, one of the figures that at the when for the patient uh, you would actually need to have the resolution of the symptoms and for the close contact or a patient of interest when they are isolated and dialyzed separately those patients would have the uh, another screening test at the day 13 and if they test the results are negative, and if they are asymptomatic, they may be able to return to their own dialysis unit. But if they have, still have some uh, residual respiratory symptoms or mild fever, they will still need to be uh, isolated, even though they may test for the uh, 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 coronavirus, uh, PCR might be negative. Um, thank you, Professor Park. So I think there's a, also an interesting uh, question that um, uh, maybe Professor Su can address. And uh, this is coming from Rohit Agarwal. Is there any insight why some COVID patients' kidneys are affected and why some don't? So I think there is a New England Journal of Medicine paper that just came out last week looking at the renotropism of SARS-CoV-2. So um, could Professor Su actually uh, give us some insights as to, you know, um, not all the patients have AKI and not all the patients, uh, COVID-19 patients, kidneys are affected. For instance, i uh, just share with you our experience in Hong Kong. So, um, in fact, we didn't actually see uh, kidney involvement in most of our COVID-19 patients. So one of the explanations from our infectious disease colleagues is that uh, a lot of our uh, majority of the COVID-19 patients in Hong Kong presented very early and then they are initiated on treatment very early. So we don't seem to see the same degree of kidney involvement as it has been reported in um, many other parts of the world. So with this, I would like um, Professor Su, uh, would you like to give mm -hmm. us some insights? Yeah, I totally agree with you. So in our um, study, this um, paper we published on KI, when we look back, this patient um, mainly uh, on site of the symptoms in the middle and the end of the January. This patient, the, uh, their yearly is very critical. And uh, in the other patients, when they infected in the February or in the March, I do not uh, mm, observe the so severe kidney injury. So I am wondering, mainly this may be related to the generation of the, this virus. So I think I, I need to, we need to do more for the detail, the infection, 
way or the the mechanism of how this virus attacking attacking the kidney. This is a very important because now we do not find so many. Mm, there are also some the, the positive and uh, the examination results in China, but the the illness is not uh, so critical compared to the beginning. Yes, I'm not sure why, but I think there may be something related to the uh, mutation of the viral or the yeah the the maybe the immuno the competence of our self. I'm not sure, yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, we also have some more very interesting questions. I think one of the hot uh, topics or hot questions is about the use of AIDS uh, or RAS blockade uh, for COVID positive cases, whether there could be um, any risk with using this uh, class of drugs. So what do both um, speakers feel about the uh, AIDS therapy, AIDS inhibitor therapy? Mm -hmm. So, Dr. Park first. <laughs> Dr. Park, do you think we uh, we should continue the ACE inhibitor, or, or whether we should be uh, stopping the ACE mm -hmm. inhibitor in COVID positive cases? Uh, I think the jury is still out there. Uh, we don't really have exact data about that. Uh, and as you mentioned, that many of the Korean patients are quite detected early, so, uh, so, and they are main, usually maintained on their uh, regimen, uh, so, and still they do fare quite well. So uh, right now I don't think there is any real uh, randomized control trial that point out that you should stop the uh, uh, AC inhibition. Mm -hmm. Okay, and what about uh, Professor Sue? Yeah, I totally agree with Dr. Park because um, and the ACE2 is the main receptor of the SARS-CoV-2. At the beginning, uh, we we think if the ACE2 is upregulated, then the infection will become the worse. So at the beginning, we think the ACI and the ARB is needed to stop without any clinical evidence just because the ACE2 is the A receptor. Maybe we have the potential risk. But uh, after what uh, we experience and also we read a lot of publications recently, there is no well controlled uh, clinical study to support we need to stop ACEI or the ARB in this cohort. And also, maybe the um, ACE2 as in the non COVID 19 patient, especially ACE2, is uh, make some protective role in the heart and in the kidney. As there are some papers show in the diabetic nephropathy, the ACE2, ACE2 is a protective factor. So to now, I, from my limited experience, there is no the evidence to refuse to use the ACEI or the ARB in this cohort. Thank you very much. It's very interesting. Uh, Professor Su, in fact, there is also another question that I would like to invite you to address. And uh, this is coming from the WAP. That is, is COVID-19 related change in the tubular morphology reversible? And also, is there a higher risk of chronic implications for subjects who develop AKI with COVID-19? Would you like to address these two questions for us? Hi, Professor Sue. Yeah, 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 yeah. So this is a, a pardon, pardon. What's the question? <laughs> Sorry for this. Um, yeah. The question is: um, 
is COVID-19 related change in the tubular morphology that you've shown us reversible? So certainly we understand that these oh. are but, um, uh, oh. are they reversible? And also is there a high risk of chronic implications in the subjects who develop AKI due to COVID-19? What's your experience from the China cohorts? Oh, okay, okay. Uh, I, I see. So for uh, this paper we published on KI, it is uh, the post-mortem uh, autopsy. So what we see is the most severe the injury of the kidney. But from the older cohort of the COVID-19 patient, uh, I think the, uh, it's not, uh, I remember the average Creatin in the the AKI group, the creatin is not very high. It is only not around the 160 micromolar. So the AKI is not relatively so well in our cohort, and it can be recovered from our experience if we corrected the hyperinfiltration or the stop to use the nephrotoxic drug or we pay more attention to the factors can make the renal injury. I think this can be recovered if we found it more earlier and uh, the prevention for the use of the natural toxic drug. Yes. Thank you, Professor Su. I have one question for Professor Park. That is, um, uh, there is a question coming in from the web. How should we dispose the post dialysate from the hemodialysis machines? What's the practice in South Korea? Uh, it's a very important and tough question. Uh, well, uh, I'm not an expert in the uh, environmental medicine in a way, uh, we do have a different sewage system for disposing of the medical waste product in our hospital. And every dialysis unit actually are mandated to uh, have that kind of system. So you don't just throw them away. But uh, I'm not so sure what you need to actually, uh, do you need to treat them with some kind of uh, cleaning agent? Uh, that I don't think I have to uh, answer right now. Right. Okay. Uh, just to share your uh, our experience in Hong Kong. I, I mean, uh, we for the uh, dialysis solutions, we usually um, would uh, add the sodium hypochlorite. Um, you know, before we discard. I mean, to discard the solutions, and then we add the uh, sodium hypochlorite as an infection control measure. So, um, yeah. So. Um, there are also another question, which is quite interesting, um, that I would like to address to both speakers. Are PD, uh, any PD performed in your units for acute kidney injury to both Professor Park and uh, Professor Sue? Do you use mm -hmm. peritoneal dialysis for acute kidney injury in your country? Uh, for Korea, so now they China, usually have... Mm -hmm have access to CRRT machines. So uh, PD would not be the first option for acute kidney injury right now. Okay, yeah, what about the situation in China? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The situation in China is the same as the Dr. Park said. Yeah, we usually use the CRRT, not the PD, yeah. Right, okay. Uh -huh. I don't know whether we have uh, time for one more quest uh, for one more question. I actually have a question to both speakers. That is, um, how do you treat actually COVID-19 infection in your own country? Like what kind of drugs uh, do you use or do you have um, clinical trials going on? So especially for hemodialysis patients or in your AKI, AKI uh, subjects. Or was it generally just supportive treatment? I, uh, I'm not aware of any uh, trials that are directed on the hemodialysis or ESRD patients. 
Uh, but for general population with COVID-19 infection, they are trying multiple uh, agents, uh, including hydroxychloroquine, or, and they even try the plasma therapy, which succeeded in two patients in our institution. But there are multiple trials going on using various antiviral or hydroxychloroquine or other agents that are known to have some partial effect on the COVID-19. Thank you. What about Professor Su? Yeah, I totally uh, agree with uh, Dr. Park, and uh, the, this is the same in China. Yeah. Right, okay. Um, because I just want to share very quickly with you about um, a uh, Lancet paper that was just came out, I think, last week from, uh, the, uh, from the University of Hong Kong. Uh, microbiology department and the infectious disease department. So because uh, they use a, a three-arm treatment versus the uh, Calitra. Uh, the three-arm treatment include Calitra, beta interferon, and rubavirin. And clearly, using the triple therapy seems to be uh, speeding up the recovery uh, from the COVID-19 infection. Um, so I think it's a very interesting finding uh, to share. Um, so okay. are there any more questions? So if no, I think it's also time for us to um, close this uh, webinar. So I'm sure you all agree that we have a very interesting and informative discussion, and uh, we heard two very interesting presentations on COVID-19. So the webinar is now coming to a close. And may I once again thank KDGO for organizing this K uh, webinar and also Novata Singapore for sponsoring this event. And thanks to all of you for your participations, and also thanks to both speakers for giving us two interesting talks, Dr. Park and Dr. Sue. And thanks to Kay Digo for inviting me to moderate this webinar. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye.